Well, this morning we are continuing our Advent themes, and today we're looking at peace, as John and Ellie reminded us as they lit the candle, and of course, as you know, today is the 73rd anniversary of Pearl Harbor, and so it's a it's interesting that you kind of juxtapose Pearl Harbor and what it did to our country by putting us into war and bringing about disharmony and and this peace, is that the right word? <laughs> a lack of peace? And yet we talk about peace and we want peace. And this time of year we sing the carols, you know, let there be peace on earth. And we long for peace and we want peace to occur in our lives. But you know, peace is hard. Peace among nations is hard. Internal peace can be a very difficult thing as well. And I don't know about you, but when I was growing up, uh, I have two brothers and the one that's closest to my age. We would fight periodically as brothers and sisters. <laughs> and my mother would make us kiss each other. <laughs> now, can I tell you, that was a very big deterrent to fighting. <laughs> it didn't change the way we felt at times. But we, when we would fight, we would try to make sure mother wasn't around. But it was not a, a peace that was longed for, <laughs> I should say. It was, it was kind of like during the Cold War back in the 70s, and, and it was... Peace was there because of mutual annihilation, the possibility that we could just blow each other up and just annihilate the whole planet. Well, that's not really a good kind of peace either, even though it's, it's a cessation of hostility. But you look around our world today, I mean, even going back to World War II when we were put in that a situation with Pearl Harbor and, and Korea and Vietnam and Iraq and Afghanistan and all of these things, you look at our country, what's happened throughout the years out in Watts back in the 60s. You look now at Ferguson, New York, and other places, and you see this unrest, and you see this lack of peace. I heard a, a guy by the name of Benjamin Watson. I don't know if you heard his interview. He's the uh, tight end for the New Orleans Saints. He's an African American, and he was commenting on the situation in Ferguson, and he said, we don't have a skin problem. We have a sin problem. And he said, until the blood of Jesus Christ changes us, we'll never have peace. And I thought that is the most succinct way to talk about and to understand any kind of unrest that we have, not only in our world, but also in our lives. Until we recognize our need for the blood of Christ, until we realize that it's only through Christ that peace could even be accomplished, or that we even have the possibility of it being accomplished in our lives, we'll never have peace. We'll never have that settled rest, that disposition on our inside that keeps us out from being in turmoil or, or knotted up. You all know what it's like to not be at peace, right? You felt the knot in your gut. You know what it is to worry. You know what it is to not have that sense of peace. We know it. We can see it in our world, but we also know it internally. But what I want to do today is to talk to you about how we can have that peace that we so long for and desire. Now, we need the blood of Christ to bring peace to our world, and that will happen one day. Uh, as Isaiah prophesied, there will be peace on earth one day when Christ returns. He'll bring and usher in peace uh, with him. But until that day, can we have peace with God? And my answer to that is yes, and it's found in our scripture today. But uh, let me... Yeah, you see the, the little bumper sticker behind you? Uh, no Jesus, no peace. No Jesus, no peace. You know, kind of play on the words. Well, that, that is about as true a bumper sticker or as a statement that you can get. Because it's only through Christ, as I said, who gives us the opportunity for peace. Now let's look at the scripture in uh, Ephesians chapter 2, 11 to 22. Paul is writing about this peace that we can't have with God. It says, there, therefore, remember that at one time... You Gentiles, and that's us in the flesh, call the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands. Remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenant of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. So think about our situation and the position that we found ourselves in. It's a hopeless position that, that all Gentiles found themselves in. Paul uses several words to describe it. He says that we're separated, we're alienated, we're strangers, there's no hope, and we're without God. 
What he means is that there is no possibility of us to ever have hope with, I mean, have peace with God. And if we don't have peace with God, we won't have internal peace. And so he says, at one time, in, in the past, this was the position that we found ourselves in. And I would say to you, anyone who is without Christ today finds themselves in this position right now. They are separated, alienated, strangers, and they're without hope, and they're without God. That's a very desperate situation to find yourself in. That's a very hopeless situation to find yourself in. But look what happens in our second takeaway. A radical change takes place, and it's found in verses 13 to 16. Paul says this, But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace, and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. And so Paul is saying there, how is the hostility, how is this division, how is this taken care of? It's by Jesus' death on the cross because he kills the hostility. And what he means by that is there was great hostility among Jew and Gentile. If you were not a Jew, you were on the outside. If you were a Gentile, you were, you were separated from all of these things. And he says now, though, that Jesus has come together to make peace, and he's come to bring us together as one body. He talked about the one man. He means the one body that, that Jesus has brought us near. Jesus has broken down the dividing wall. Jesus has done everything possible so that peace can occur, so that everyone can be brought together under the, the blood of Christ. All you have to do simply is to trust in Him. He says that He abolished the old covenant by creating the new. Why did He abolish the old? Well, the old, as the writer of Hebrews said, was obsolete. It was passing away. Under the old covenant, you had, you had the ability, if you could keep the commandments, to be right with God or to have peace with God. But no one could do that, and so there needed to be something else as we look back on it. What needed to happen? A new covenant needed to come about. The new covenant came about through the blood of Christ. The old covenant was predicated on the law. The new covenant is predicated on the blood of Christ. The old was difficult to know and, in fact, impossible to keep. The new covenant, we don't have to keep it. We simply trust it and let the blood cleanse us. And that's how he brought reconciliation into the world. He did it through his, the finished work of Christ on the cross. Look at our third takeaway. This is what Jesus came to do. He came to be the preacher of peace. Verses 17 and 18. It says that he came and preached peace to you who were far off, and peace to those who were near. For through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father. Now when he said that he came to preach peace to those who were far off and to those who were near, what he means there is not that some were closer to God than others, but he means those who were part of the Old Covenant, those who were, were the, the Jews. They were considered closer to God. They were in the Covenant. The Gentiles were out, so they were far off. The others were in. And so he brought them together, those who were far and those who were near, so that they could then have peace with God. And in this if you want to put a mathematical equation on this, peace equals salvation, which equals access to God, which equals forgiveness. You have peace, you have salvation, you have access to God, and you have forgiveness. That means if you're near to God, that means that He's near to you, and that means that there's no longer something separating you, there's no division wall, there's nothing that can, can alienate you now from God. Why? Because Jesus, the preacher of peace, came... He preaching, nearness, closeness, forgiveness, all of this because of his finished work on the cross. And that means that now both Jew and Gentile have access to God. He doesn't, he, there's no one group that can say they have special privilege. You, if you're a Jew, you don't have special privilege. If you're a Gentile, you don't have special privilege. All have special privilege in the sense that all who trust in him have access to him. So let's look at our fourth takeaway. What's the net effect of this? 19 to 22, Paul writes this. He says, So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, 
in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. Remember your former position. Remember the position that was just an untenable position, a place that was hopeless and helpless. You were alienated. You were separated. You were a stranger. There was no hope, and you were without God. He's now bringing it all back. This, this was our position, but then he says, now everything changed. Jesus changed everything when he came as a child, when he lived his life, when he died on the cross, and when he rose again on the third day. Everything changed. No longer are you a stranger. No longer are you an alien. No, we're all fellow citizens of heaven. And we're built on the foundation. The old was built on the foundation of the law. The new is built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets because of the blood of Christ. And so we now are all of these things that we weren't before, we have now. We have hope. We have closeness with God. We are in the family, if you will. And the reason is, is because Christ is the cornerstone. He set the foundation. Cornerstones are very important when you're building. If you put the right cornerstone in, if you put your corners right, everything is built and it's set right. Well, when Jesus came as our cornerstone, everything was built right. And he holds everything together. So we don't have to. It isn't about our abilities. It's about his finished work. And he's building He's building this building, and I would call it the church, for all who trust in him. He said he's building a holy dwelling. Did you know that the church is a holy dwelling? Because it's the saints who dwell there. It's the saints who worship there. Certainly there will be the holy dwelling one day in heaven when we're all together. But until that day, we are the holy dwelling because we are the people who have been born anew by the Spirit of God. So what does that mean to us? Well, I want to conclude by looking at Romans chapter 5. If you remember back to our series in Romans, this is a very important passage. But it sums up, if you will, uh, what Paul is saying here. Paul wrote Romans before he wrote Ephesians. Listen to what he said. He says, Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And I would say to you, before I read further, for those who would say that peace with God is an impossibility, that you have to do something in order to gain that peace, I would say look at Romans 5.1. He says we have peace with God. Why? Because we've been justified by faith. Not because you've done a work, you've done a thing, you've done a ritual. None of that matters. It's faith. Justification by grace through faith. Through him we have also obtained access by faith into the grace in which we stand, and we rejoice in hope of the glory of God not only that, but we rejoice in our suffering, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit, who has been given to us. You see, because of Christ's work, it's all of Christ's work, we now have peace with God. And how does this peace come? It comes by faith. And when hardships come, and many of us are enduring hardships, we endure it with hope because we have the peace of God in us. And you know, peace is some, one of those things. Have you ever tried to walk in a room at night in a dark room that you're not familiar with? Really? Have you ever done that? What do we do? We, we kind of slide our feet. We kind of grope for the wall or a chair or something because we don't want to hurt ourselves. That is not a peaceful walk, is it? It can be a painful walk. And so that's what it is before Christ comes. But what happens is when Christ comes, it's like walking in the dark in your house at night. If you get up like I do, out of bed every night, uh, you know how to make your way into the bathroom without stubbing something. I can do it with my eyes closed. Unless Beth puts something there to trip me up. <laughs> I can make it without pain. Well, that's what peace is like. It's like unrest because there's no peace and we don't know what's going to happen next when we take that next step. Peace is knowing even in the dark I can take the next step with hope and with confidence. Not because my confidence is in me it's because I know the way and I know how to get there from here but it's because we put our faith in Christ and Christ is the light of the world and he gives us the next step. You see peace is not the absence of trouble. 
If you're looking for that kind of peace, you won't find it. Not in Scripture anyway. God does not promise us the absence of, of, of troubles or hardships in this life. But he says they produce certain things for us. See, peace is the knowledge that God's love has been poured into our hearts, giving us the ability to trust him completely. And that's the difference. You see, it's kind of like last week when we talked about um, hope. Hope is, not, hope is not wishful thinking. Hope is complete trust in God and what God is doing. And so that's where peace comes from, too. It's that understanding that he has poured his love into our hearts, and we completely trust him because of it. So if you're struggling with peace in your life, don't try to fix it. Trust in him. Don't try to turn a light switch on so you can see the way because you, it's beautiful. You simply trust in him and he'll light your path and he'll give you the peace you need to endure whatever it is you're doing. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this peace that you give us. We thank you that your peace is not dependent on circumstance. It's not dependent on anything. It's a gift. It's, it's grace. It's charis. It's that gift you give us solely because you're our God, because you love us, because you poured your love into our hearts. And I pray, Father, that you would help each of us today. If we're struggling with a lack of peace, if our hearts are in disarray, that we'd slow down enough to, to take our eyes off of our circumstances and put them on you. And recognize that even in the midst of the direst of circumstances, we can have peace of heart and mind because we know your ways. Lord, we thank you for that love that you poured into our hearts. And may that love overflow from us to others today. And may you help us to be instruments of your peace as we talk to people, as we care for people, as we love those who are struggling. In Jesus' name we pray.